Again, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pepper Money New Zealand uh, Insights webinar for Q2 2024. Uh, many of you will know me, but for those that don't, uh, I'm Campbell Smith. I'm the New Zealand Country Head here at Pepper Money, and I am delighted to be your MC today. Before we kick off, I'm just going to cover off a little bit of housekeeping. If you haven't already, could you please place yourselves on mute? Um, our speakers today are undoubtedly going to spark your curiosity and uh, always prompt um, some really good questions. Uh, we do have a lot of content to get through today. So with that in mind, uh, we would ask that you put your questions into the Teams chat or the Teams Q&A tool. Um, and if we have time, uh, we'll circle back to those at the end. Uh, often, as many of you will be aware, uh, we do run out of time. Um, and if that is the case, we will certainly answer all of those questions uh, after the event. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we're very excited to be joined today by uh, Centrix Chief Operating Officer, Monica Lacey, passionate about providing a robust strategy for businesses to help ensure they understand their credit risks and minimise the potential impact this can have on their businesses. Monica is committing to providing financial literacy for all Kiwis. In her seven years at Centrix, Monica has led the launch of several new products to ensure customers receive the best in market solutions to support their credit risk functions. I'm excited to have Monica join us today and share some insights into consumers, your clients and their behavior. Welcome, Monica. Thanks, Campbell. And hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yeah, great to have you, Monica. Look, I'll kick on to our questions. Um, as everyone on the call will be well aware, there is a lot going on in our market right now. Uh, what are you seeing as the latest key trends? Yes, yeah, so undoubtedly we are um, in a situation where the economy is definitely having a few challenges. So I think it's really important that we bring lots of different pieces of information together to try and get a clearer view of what's going on. So a lot of our data comes from um, credit information, so comprehensive credit reporting data that's uploaded from businesses like finance companies, banks, telcos, utilities, as well as inquiry information coming through from um, lenders and just general service providers across businesses and consumers. So what we're seeing at the moment is um, definitely the most um, concerning issue is that we're seeing an overall demand, um, sorry, an increase of arrears across um, our consumer portfolios. So it's a little bit volatile at the moment. Last month, the numbers showed us that 474,000 New Zealanders are in arrears um, at that point in time. That number right. does go up and down a little bit from month to month. But what is really encouraging is that most of those people are only in arrears um, in They've only missed one payment. So what that means is a lot of people um, perhaps are lazy payers and they've just paid their invoice a little bit late. And then when that's been reported through to us, um, it comes through as overdue. So we've got 114,000 Kiwis at the moment who are 60 days plus over, overall and um, overdue. So that's the number that we are a little bit more concerned about. They sure. um, obviously are in a little bit more serious debt and potentially struggling to get out of that. Um, but that number as a percentage has remained really stable for a good six months, so it's not deteriorating, which is really good. Um, and of course, the lending sector has a lot more robust processes in place these days to help support individuals who might be experiencing some difficulty in meeting their obligations than they did perhaps um, five or six years ago. So um, generally, I guess what we can firmly say is that consumers are experiencing a little bit of difficulty based on the cost of living and certainly I think the um, impact on interest rates has definitely had an impact as well of and then that's flowing through into businesses too so we're starting to see um, business liquidations increase year on year so um, last month we had 269 insolvencies um, versus 161 same time the year prior so the number is increasing although still a low number um, but I guess as consumers start to reduce their discretionary spend um, that's having an impact on businesses too so the important thing to highlight is that although the arrears positions are high 
higher than they were a few years ago. We're coming off really historic lows through COVID um, where we had really artificial lows because businesses just simply weren't running their usual credit processes. So actually where we are now is back to 2018 levels. So it's no way near where we were during GFC, which is a really positive sign. And I think the overall message is that generally people are doing a pretty good job of managing their cash flow. Yeah, no, thank you. That's great insights and some silver lining there to listen to 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 you know what you're saying. Um, and you spoke to mortgage arrears, um, which to look at your data eased for the second consecutive month uh, last month, but are still up. So. What implications does this have for the housing market and for homeowners? Yeah, so um, mortgage arrears are sitting at about 1.5%. So, so 1.5% of people that hold a mortgage are in arrears, and nearly half of those are only one payment down. So, oh, sorry, just over half of one payment down. So it's not um, doom and gloom, but certainly the right. mortgage is the last payment to go. Most people will do everything they can to meet that payment obligation. So a little bit concerning, but still very low. I think the reality is that while we're all, um, you know, firmly fixed on what the RBNZ is going to do about the OCR, um, there is going to be a little bit of stress with um, homeowners. And but I think people are getting better at um, reducing their discretionary spend and supporting themselves to get through those um, hard times. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree. Um, there has been. Um, an adjustment out there, but the, the cost of living crisis is still very real for many Kiwis. Um, having said that, it hasn't impacted everyone equally. Who, in your view, have been the most impacted and, and what are the reasons for that, Monica? Yeah, we're definitely seeing an emergence of um, almost a tale of two economies. So you've really got those individuals um, who have a mortgage and are heavily dependent on that and those that don't. So our data shows us that, um, and this isn't unusual in, in historical context, that individuals under the age of 25 really do it tough when it comes to cost of living increases. You know, their income's lower, um, rents are impacted and they're, they're just not able to probably have the experience to manage those situations as well as the older generations. But what we've started to see emerging over the last couple of years is that those people who are aged between 40 and 49 are increasingly experiencing debt stress. And that would be an indication that, you know, that's, that segment is more likely to own a home. Um, and so they're probably just experiencing a little bit more stress there. Look, I think overall, over the rest of the year, we'll probably see arrears rise a little bit more. Um, they have been steadily increasing over time, albeit small numbers. So um, I think it's important to keep an eye out for that. And I think that overall, um, it's just really important to remember that, you know, the processes that, that all of these lenders have um, are much more robust and we're much better at communicating with individuals and businesses who um, might be struggling. Um, and certainly I think that's where the advisors can help because, you know, you guys are the experts in this field and no one knows the options available in the market better than you do. So having a conversation with a person or with a, a business who, you know, likely has leveraged their home to, um, finance their company as you know New Zealand is mostly made up of small businesses so that's most likely right. the case and the reality is that they probably aren't going to be straightforward lending um, structures they'll be a little bit more complex and I think the advisor market out there has really got um, the best expertise to help support those individuals Absolutely. Um, through those um, situations and offer different solutions that are available. Yeah, no, thank you for that insight, Monica. And so credit um, demand, you know, consumer credit demand in particular is up from last year, um, but we've felt a bit of a slowdown in recent months. So what are your predictions for the balance of 2024? Yeah, so um, we would expect to see that October, November, December, we'll start seeing an increase in credit demand, which is a seasonal trend that's coming into Christmas and, and um people to start getting a little bit more active in their space. I'd like to think that we'll also see a little bit more activity in the mortgage space. I think we're starting to see some signs that maybe things might be changing. You know, we're coming off a really um, low volume situation 
for the housing sector, as you mm. all know. Um, but, you know, the Bright Line test is coming to its end, so that might see a little bit more investor activity going on. We're coming into spring, which will hopefully bring a little bit more activity. Um, so fingers crossed we see a bit of a change there, but, um, you know, I think it'll continue overall to be a little bit soft, but hopefully mm. we see a little bit more activity in, in your area. Yeah, thank you. And you touched on this earlier, Monica, but company defaults and liquidations are unfortunately up year on year. I actually felt that um, metric you presented was quite stark. So what is this um, likely to um, mean for Kiwis? What impact will this have on Kiwis and their households? Yeah, I think it is a really sad statistic, particularly mm. because most of our businesses are small mum and dad owned companies and they're just, um, you know, running the business to get by. They're not, you know, making millions. But um, look, the reality is that when Kiwis hunker down, it does have an impact on discretionary spend, which has a flow on effect. Um, so I guess the best thing we can do is to try and shop local and um, where we can to really pay um, those invoices on time because cash flow becomes really tight at this point um, and anything we can do to help there is really important. Um, you know, overall, I think the biggest um, thing that we're very fortunate for is that the um, unemployment rate is still quite low, so um, long may that continue. If that starts to go um, north, then I think we might start seeing a little bit more difficulty emerging in the market, but Overall, so far, we seem to be holding pretty well. So um, undoubtedly, there are some businesses out there that are doing it pretty tough and, and you know, just doing everything they can to get by. And I think, again, you know, having conversations with those businesses and those individuals impacted from your perspective will be really, really helpful just to try and navigate what they can do in the short term. Um, so we just have to keep an eye on things, really. Yeah, thank you. And so where do you see the opportunities for advisors to provide solutions and how can they navigate these these conversations with their clients? Mm, so I think definitely just their expertise and understanding the options out there. Um, you know, the, the regulatory environment from a bank perspective is constantly morphing. You know, we'll start seeing the introduction of debt to income ratios, which yeah. might reduce the ability for the traditional banks to support some um, more complex situations and that's definitely where some of the non-bank lenders come into their strengths but really from an advisor perspective you guys are the experts out there and you add a lot of value for a lot of these customers so I think continuing to um, educate and advise on the options that are available is going to add a lot of um, important information to some of these situations that are emerging. Yeah I know that's really great thank you so much for those insights Monica. It provides us all with a really good understanding of the current climate and the likely challenges and opportunities our advisors and their clients will need to navigate throughout the balance of 2024 and and beyond. If there's one further message or one last message you want to leave us with today, what would that be? Um, look, I'm sure you're all doing it because it's the nature of your business. But one thing we say to everybody is just if you are talking to someone who was starting to struggle, just to really encourage them to speak with their credit providers and um, their advisors, accountants, to really seek some advice early. Um, I know it's probably quite a daunting prospect to be faced with that challenge. And the last thing we want to do is actually have people burying their head in the sand. So just to keep that communication up, there are options out there, as you know, and, um, you know, there are a lot of support um, mechanisms in place. So we just really need to open up and encourage that dialogue. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Great, great last note. Um, please also note that Centrix uh, provides a really useful and data rich monthly credit insights report that I'm a recipient of every month and I, I find incredibly useful. So it is available to you at no cost. Um, and if of interest, um, please send an email to marketing at centrix.co.nz. That's marketing at centrix.co.nz. And um, they'll get you added to this distribution group. Um, but thanks again, Monica. I really appreciate your time. Um, All right. Thanks, everyone. We're now joined by our second guest speaker for you today, Real Estate Institute of New Zealand's CEO, Jen Beard. Jen joined the REINZ in July 2021. In her short time with REINZ, 
she has overseen a period of considerable change. She's committed to championing the world class real estate profession. Uh, and before joining REINZ, Jen was general manager city growth for the Hamilton City Council um, and is a proud girl from the Waikato, uh, where she is responsible for the planning of the long term future of the metropolitan scale city. Jen was chief marketing officer at Barfoot and Thompson for nearly 10 years and considers her role at REINZ as coming home to a profession that she loves. Jen, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Campbell. Um, we call it Rhines. Rhines like Heinz, not Reens like Beans. Um, it's a little easy to am, say too. <laughs> yeah, and I am a proud girl from the Waikato. I was just getting teased about the amount of fog there um, on the weekend. So um, those of you from the Waikato represent. Um, yeah, so anyway, the Real Estate Institute, this is an organisation that's been around for uh, 110 years. And uh, when it was set up all those decades ago, uh, it was set up to do essentially what it does now. And that is to support a thriving real estate profession and to help um, think about what that collective needs to look like. So you won't be surprised to know that we do a whole heap of advocacy. So we're regularly talking to the BODs in Wellington, both politicians and um, officials, about the legislative change that is coming uh, the way of our industry. I'm sure that you guys have enormous amounts of this as well. At top of our agenda at the moment is AML. Um, I'm sure that makes most of you shudder. Um, but it has been a really big deal in this industry. Uh, but so, so from a Ryan's perspective, we do a lot of advocacy. We also do events, sorts of things that you would expect a membership organisation to do. But there are two other parts of this organisation that are, in my humble opinion, the most interesting. Um, one is education. So we provide um, about 40% of all of the continuing professional development in real estate and deliver qualifications. But we are also guardians of the best property data set in um, the country. So that is what I'm going to share a bit of that with you today. So um, we collect unconditional sales data. So the only people that have the unconditional sales, we think that we probably have like eight weeks on average uh, of uh, the value of that data before it becomes public information. And that's when you'll see it uh, feeding into things like homes.co.nz and into CoreLogic and those sorts of um, players. So ours is the most recent. Uh, and it means that it's a bit more of a lead indicator in terms of what's going on in the market. The other thing we, we do is obviously talk to real estate agents all of the time, and they are not backwards in coming forward um, and telling us exactly what's going on in the market. And I guess if there's a really key piece of information for you guys, um, you know, they, real estate agents um, on a street near you, they feel the winds of change in the market long before it's an unconditional um, sale, long before it's a data set, a data point for us, much, much longer before it's a data point um, that becomes public information. So staying close to those guys in your local area is going to help you um, have your finger on the pulse in terms of uh, buyer activity and seller activity um, uh, for your clients. Um, but also, I would say that you play a really important role in the lives of real estate agents. You are an important part of the ecosystem and you can effectively speed it up or slow it down. And what I'm hearing a lot from real estate agents at the moment is that, ah, oh, there's no hurry, you know, whatever. When you find a property that you like, come and talk to me about it. Um, and that adds to sort of the slowing of the pace of the market. Um, Sometimes it also means that those buyers are missing out because, yes, things are definitely slower. I'm going to show you some graphs that show that. Um, but there are still lots of active buyers, um, and I wouldn't want your clients to miss out because you've got we've got heaps of time. Often you don't. Uh, so, look, I'm going to start with some positives, and then I'm going to show you my graphs. Uh, there is absolutely still sales happening in the market. Yes, it is slower, not as slow as last year. So, year-on-year -year sales volumes are up. Last year was a really challenging year in real estate. It was very slow and very painful. I um, was listening to what Monica was talking about in terms of you know challenges for businesses, and I would put real estate businesses um, in that camp in terms of really starting to go, oof, you know, when are things going to ease up a little bit for us? So it's been really challenging. 
And there are still people that are wanting to sell. You know, lots we're all we're all loss. We have a loss aversion, right? So if I think that two years ago I could have got a million dollars for my property, and now if I took it to market, I get it. I could get eight fifty. I feel like I've lost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The fact that I paid three hundred thousand dollars for it fifteen years ago is neither here nor there. People don't want to bring their properties to market at this time of the cycle, generally. But we still see people who are moving to Australia, who are leaving their husbands um, and doing all of these sorts of things that necessitate a property transaction. And that's where you and that's where our members uh, come in. I would add to uh, to that, we're seeing more and more people bring their properties to market because they are carrying too much debt and they need to downsize, offload, and are really hearing that in all corners of the market. So I think that's that's kind of interesting. Um, we're starting to see uh, the pace of sales increase as well. So days to sell is coming down compared to last year. So really, um, the Ryan's numbers that we that we uh, present every month are, are now comparing this current market to last year's really shocking market. So what I'm going to show you, I'm going to get my slides ready, try and do two things at once. Um, what I'm going to show you is is just a bit of a comparison so you can see what these what the numbers look like now compared to, to the longer term average. So I am going to share my screen and it's going to be a really smooth transition because I'm very clever. Ta -da. Hold on. How about that? Who would have thought I could navigate that so well? Right. Um, now I've just got to get the uh, slides to change. I'm sure I can do that piece too. Maybe I can't. Bear with me one moment. There we go. Um, hopefully you can see that. So, so yes, Ryan's, Ryan's stats are... Uh, delivered on a monthly basis. And if you want to know the what the median sale price is in Christchurch or wherever it is that you are and what the days to sell number is, you can go to the news and insights section of our website, ryans.co.nz. All of that information is there. I'm not going to cover that today. Um, what I do want to do is show you some of these graphs. So sales volume is the number that we care about in real estate because everybody is earning commission only. If you don't make a sale, you don't make any money. Um, and so, you know, price is going up and down a little bit doesn't really have much of an impact um, on revenue, but the actual volume of sales does. And what you can see is that for some time, sales numbers have been um, well below the long-term average. You can see the COVID numbers there. Um, that big dip just after June 2021, that is um, the long August to October lockdown um, that Auckland and Northland had. Uh, so we're about, in fact, the latest number I saw was 11%, 11 nationally, 11% below the long-term average. Um, if there's anybody here from the West Coast, anybody from the West Coast, um, you can just pretend this isn't happening because the market on the West Coast is really strong. Sales volumes on the West Coast 30% higher than the long-term average last month. Um, having an absolute knockout of um, a real estate season down there. Um, things are going really well in the economy on the West Coast, and you can see it in the property market, but everywhere else. So you can see what I mean here in terms of, um, you know, those numbers. I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, but, you know, this is the this is the 2022 year that was really challenging for real estate. And when you compare it, still down and a bit rubbish from a real estate perspective, but better than last year. Right, my next one, listings. Uh, so that big dip again, that is the Auckland lockdown um, where listings fell off a actual cliff, unsurprisingly. And then people rushing back into the market to uh, to grab those gains. So that peak, uh, that the big peak, before 2022, that is the peak of the market. Lots of people uh, jumping in, trying to... Um, take their winnings uh, while they could. And since then, um, as we have seen uh, the OCR increase and increase and increase and increase and increase, we have seen the number of people that are choosing to bring their properties to market fall and fall and fall. And you can see over the course of um, last year, really 
low levels of new listings coming to market. Lots of people saying, oh, now now is absolutely not the right time. Lots of uncertainty. What we find is that when the, when the OCR is volatile, people don't make choices. Even if they, even if it, like where it is now, I mean, you can see what's happened to listings now, much more even, much higher levels because people are like, okay, cool, it's the, the interest rates are where they are. I know what I can afford. Therefore, I'm going to make some some choices. I imagine that you see some sort, those sorts of trends um, for you, in your market as well. What I did start to hear uh, just after Christmas, um, real estate agents starting to feel very good about life. Lots and lots of listings coming to market post the election. Um, the second coming had happened. Um, everything was going to change and magically the economy would be better um, and uh, property prices would go up. Clearly that has not happened. Um, and what we saw was a massive surge of listings coming to market uh, and not a, a subsequent response from buyers. And so we end up with this graph here. So this is total stock on the market. And you can see that um, since the beginning of 2022, the total amount of property for sale at any given time in New Zealand has increased, uh, it has been over the long-term average and continuing to go up. So we saw a whole load of listings come in. Uh, no, actually, let me back up the bus. We actually saw those listings fall to below the long-term average levels through 2022. But we also saw our buyers absolutely pull the handbrake on and slow down completely. So the, the average days to sell blew out, which meant that every month, uh, real estate agents were listing more than they were selling, which meant that stock levels went up. When I first started uh, in this role in July 2021, there were 12,300 properties for sale in New Zealand. Last month, there were 33,000. Uh, so significant increase, significantly more choice for buyers that is making them slow down. It's making them take their time. They can wait for the right property. They can negotiate hard and they absolutely are. Uh, so we are seeing that all over the place. Um, and yeah, so so this picture is, I mean, this picture shows now today very much a buyer's market. Um, I, at research sample of one, I sold a rental property because I had too much debt. Uh, last month, at least I'm honest about it, um, last month, and I um, I felt like I gave the property away. I didn't. I still made money on it, right? I have a loss aversion. I am a human after all. And I, I ran into the guy that sold it a couple of weeks back and he said, oh, shit, you know, you'd be pleased you sold your property last month. He said, you know, we, we are just seeing prices continuing to go down for those kinds of properties. So there is absolutely some downside risk um, still. Like We are hearing that particularly in the bigger markets, particularly in Auckland and particularly around the South Auckland, West Auckland, those sorts of areas. Um, you know, I, I keep saying that if you are if you were, have the equity or can afford the um, interest rates as they are now, it's a fantastic time to buy. In terms, from a pure pricing perspective, still nationally about 16% off the peaks of um, December 2021. Not if you're in Christchurch. Um, Canterbury, they're back to around about that level. Not far off the actual peak, actually. Um, but North Island, no North Island big markets, uh, the prices are looking really attractive um, right now. Uh, in terms of, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and you can watch my talking head instead. I mean, in terms of what's to come, I mean, we would expect things to be pretty much, you know, around about where they are now for the next few months. I love that Monica thinks that it's just about spring, not where I am, still in the middle of winter here. Um, anyway, just about spring market, we can hold on. It'll be really interesting to see what does happen. I am not hearing yet from agents um, out in the suburbs that they are seeing a significant increase in investors coming back to the market. Absolutely first time buyers. Lots of them, lots of those people going, yeah, now is my time. Um, so we've seen sort of median prices bumbling along the current level for 
four months or so now, there's really nothing to suggest that that is going to change in the near future. Um, but there is downside risk. A lot of the things that um, Monique mentioned, um, or Monica mentioned, sorry, um, in regards to people's concerns about jobs, you know, this is, it's not really a rational market. Um, you know, if we we're talking about uh, commercial and industrial buildings, yes, but, you know, people don't go into a commercial building and, you know, you can love it, let's buy it. Um, but, you know, they do in real estate when things are going well, they act emotionally, uh, but we also act emotionally when we have a perception that our jobs might be at risk. And even though those numbers are relatively small from a wider economy perspective, those are the things that give people the wobbles, makes them very concerned about uh, battening down the hatches and, you know, staying in on a Saturday night, those sorts of things. Um, I would like to think that we will start to see some investor interest return now that things have eased up for them. But as I said, not really seeing it just yet. Um, we also, in a lot of those big markets, have seen uh, a lot of that building activity land, all those new properties that were consented through that construction boom um, a, a few years ago. You know, the, a lot of those are, are in market now. You think about the, you do a search for properties in West Auckland, there is literally hundreds of two bedroom townhouses for sale. Um, you know, th that is the that is what housing growth looks like. Will keep a cap on um, price inflation. So there is a there is a lot of supply still in in the system. Um, and then really fundamentally, property is uh, a function of the wider economy, uh, and particularly a function of interest rates. And you know, while those interest rates are where they are they will be having the desired effect on people's ability to buy new things and houses are included in that. So I think that the Reserve Bank will be very pleased that um, what they're doing is doing exactly what they had hoped for. Um, our members, though, uh, would prefer something slightly different um, so that we could get a bit more momentum back in the market. Um, but I guess I would finish by saying that, you know, this this is an ecosystem and everybody has their part to play. And I know that our members are really value the relationships that they have with advisors in market, that, you know, you have um, some intelligence and, um, you know, information and customer knowledge that is really valuable to them. Um, them understanding how they can support buyers that don't have an advisor to understand what their options are and have somebody that they can trust um, to move quickly to advise their buyers is, is a really helpful thing. So I'd really encourage you all to build those relationships if you haven't already. Um, that is me. Feel free to ask me any curly questions you might have. I'm really happy to answer them. That's generous of you, Jen. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I guess a couple of key points that I've taken out of your presentation today is, you know, firstly, um, we all agree advisors play a really important role in the uh, real estate ecosystem um, and their active support in a more challenging market such as that that we're currently experiencing um, will ensure that their clients are ready and ready to act and, and, and you know, these advisors make a real difference to their clients success in market. Um, to your point about the West Coast, uh, we're seeing it too, so I completely mm -hmm. agree. Um, oh, regional variation is a real thing. Um, mm. And RINES, not R-E-I-N-Z, the RINES monthly property report um, is a data point that I use each and every month. Mm. Uh, um, and that breaks down the sales data by the territorial authority. Um, so you will have the most update, localised information on your local catchment. And, and the last point, which I thought was a great one, was make friends with your local real estate agents. They feel the winds. Um, they can tell you about the changes in the market well before um, those changes become a data point and you can help them ensure um, you know, that the, your, your clients know what to do um, and when to move and how to secure uh, the property that you want. So thank you. Um, I do have one question here. Um, and seeing you're still feeling brave today and I want to step Go up on, to the plate, I'll, I'll, I'll play it back to you. Um, so Sue, Sue, thank you very much for this contribution. We really appreciate your engagement. Um, Sue says, I really don't believe any of us tell clients there are there is no hurry. I can't mm. imagine any advisor thinking that they don't need clients. Um, some banks are sending back applications saying, sorry, but we just cannot meet your deadline. 
So we're not going to accept the application, which I think is woeful. Um, my, my, my opinion, not Sue's. Um, are you having conversations with lenders about their timeframes, Jen? Do you engage with the with the big banks and um, and the non-banks? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, not so much um, non-bank lenders, but yeah, absolutely every time I get a, an opportunity to have this conversation with um, with bankers, I do um, because I I hear I hear you, Sue. Um, and actually, it's when I have these conversations with um, real estate agents, they probably don't actually make a distinction between banks and advisors, um, but. Yeah, look, I know that they have been tardy and and it's been really challenging. And actually, frankly, I don't think there's any excuse anymore. I mean, I remember back when things were going absolute gangbusters and, you know, bankers were still turning things over pretty quickly and yeah. saying, oh, God, we can't meet your deadline. Um, but to be to have sales numbers where they are now and like the actual number of offers that are being made, the number of people showing up to auctions, the number of auctions um, being had, there's no real excuse for that for that. Um, time frame uh, issue with banks, but yes, I am having that conversation. In fact, I'm having a conversation with the ASB in a couple of weeks. Fantastic, thanks for that, Jen. Um, and that brings us to a close. So, um, a huge thanks from us, and I'm sure all the advisors on the call to both Monica and Jen for their fantastic presentations and and insights. Um, very much appreciate your time and your engagement. So, uh, thank you again. Uh, where to from here, and what can you expect from us? Well. Uh, you'll receive a follow-up email uh, shortly after today's presentation, and that will include a couple of things. Firstly, the feedback survey. Uh, we want these to be rich, insightful, and valuable for you, um, and we really value your feedback, so we'd love to know what you thought of today. And any thoughts as to how we can add value in these sessions and add value for you. Um, and we will also be sending out a recording of today's session. Um, so the slides that Jim presented today uh, will be available to you together with Jean's presentation and our Q&A with Monica. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. Really appreciate your time and attention. I hope you found it worthwhile. Um, and if you have any other questions, please do reach out to your Pepper Money BDM. We are here to help. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.